Hello, welcome to today's lecture. In a previous lecture, I had introduced the Doppler imaging modes and briefly explained the different modes that are available in ultrasound systems. In this lecture, we will dive more deeper into Doppler ultrasound, understanding the physics behind it, as well as the different parameters that define the Doppler frequency shift. Let's begin. So we know that Doppler ultrasound is a non-invasive test to measure blood flow of, through blood vessels. It can help us diagnose blood clots, heart valve defects, a blocked artery called an arterial occlusion, as well as arterial stenosis. There are several types of Doppler. One is continuous Doppler. We have briefly discussed this earlier. Pulse wave Doppler, color Doppler, and power Doppler. If you remember the Doppler effect, this occurs when a relative motion exists between a wave source and a wave receiver. It was defined by Christian Andreas Doppler back in the early 1800s, and this Doppler effect has been incorporated into medical ultrasound to assess the blood flow velocities. So Doppler ultrasound is based on a shift of ultrasound frequency caused by a moving reflector. So if you see in this schematic here, we have our transducer that is in stationary phase. And if you have a stationary reflector, then whatever signal that you transmit, it will be have the same frequency of, as the signal that you uh, that is reflected from that stationary reflector. Now, if that reflector is moving towards the transducer, the frequency of the sound that is received back from the transducer would be higher frequency compared to the transmitted ultrasound signal. And if the reflector is moving away from that transducer, then the frequency that is received by the transducer will be lower in frequency than that of the transmitted signal. Now, what are the reflectors in your body? When we talk about blood vessels, the main reflectors are the red blood cells, or blood cells in general. So the blood cells will scatter ultrasound. And these cells are much, much smaller than the ultrasound wavelength. So when we, if you remember scattering physics, we talked about the wavelength times the diameter of the uh, scatterer. So Ka, this is A being the radius. So Ka, if it's much, much less than one, then this scatterer is considered as a Rayleigh scatterer. And red blood cells in the body are considered Rayleigh scatterers. Now the Doppler frequency shift is defined by twice that of the frequency of the incident beam, the velocity of the blood flow, in this case, the red blood cell velocity, the cosine of the Doppler angle here, as well as the speed of sound, in this case, the longitudinal sound speed. So if we look at the schematic right here, the transducer is sending an ultrasound of our initial frequency of Fi. Now in this schematic, the blood flow is towards from left to right. So it's moving away from the transducer. So in this case, the reflected signal back would be in lower frequency, denoted by Fr here. Now the Doppler angle is denoted by theta here. And this also affects the Doppler frequency shift that will be measured. Now, if you rearrange this equation, then the blood velocity can be calculated as follows. It equals the Doppler shift frequency times the sound speed. All of that divided by two times the frequency of the incident beam times the cosine of the Doppler angle. So this is what is being calculated in Doppler ultrasound systems to assess blood flow. Now, the Doppler frequency, as I mentioned, depends on several factors. It's proportional to the blood velocity. So if the velocity of the blood doubles, then the Doppler frequency shift will double. Similarly, if the blood velocity decreases by or is halved, right, then the Doppler shift frequency will also decrease by half. Now, ultrasound frequency of the incident beam also affects it. You see that in the equation that the Doppler shift frequency is proportional to the frequency of the incident beam. So if, you, if the incident beam has a frequency of 10 megahertz, then the Doppler frequency shift would be twice that 
of the Doppler frequency shift if the incident beam is at 5 MHz. Similarly, if the Doppler frequency is, uh, if the incident frequency was decreased by half, then the Doppler shift frequency will also decrease by half. So this proportionality exists. The third parameter that affects the Doppler shift frequency is the Doppler angle. So here I show a situation where we have the uh, an incident frequency beam as 5 megahertz, the speed of sound as 1540, and the blood velocity as 1 meters per second. So blood is flowing in this vessel here at 1 meters per second. And what we do here is I am changing the angle, the Doppler angle. So if for a situation of zero degree Doppler angle, now this zero degree doesn't often happen in the, in the body, um, but nonetheless, if we are able to image blood flow with a Doppler angle of zero degree, and you plug in the rest of these parameters into the Doppler equation, then we will get a Doppler shift frequency of 6.5 kilohertz. If we increase that Doppler angle to 30 degrees, then the Doppler shift frequency will be 5.6 kilohertz. Similarly, at 60 degree Doppler angle, the Doppler shift frequency is 3.3 kilohertz. So you notice that as we increase the Doppler angle, the Doppler shift frequency also decreases. So it's important to set the Doppler uh, angle right in your system. And also, if you have um, situated the transducer such that the Doppler angle is 90 degrees, meaning that the transducer is directly perpendicular to the blood vessel, then the Doppler shift frequency will be calculated as 0 kilohertz. That means there's no Doppler shift that can be detected. And it's because of this cosine function right here. Here I plot the cosine of the Doppler angle from 0 to 180 degrees. As you can see, as we are increasing the Doppler angle from zero to 90 degrees, that cosine of the Doppler angle decreases from one all the way down to zero right here. And if we increase the Doppler angle even more than 90 degrees, then that cosine turns negative. So what this indicates in a Doppler um, uh, image is that the positive cosine angle um, for flow towards the transducer is denoted with angles that are less than 90 degrees. And if you move perpendicular to the transducer, then you wouldn't see any Doppler shift. And if you go to negative cosine of the Doppler angles, that indicates that the signal is flowing away from the transducer. Here, what happens is that the frequency of the reflected sound, again, it is uh, becoming much less than the incident beam. So this is important to note. In practice, what is typically done in the clinic is that we keep the Doppler angle somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees for optimum estimates of the Doppler shift frequency. Now let's go through an example problem. Suppose that the frequency of the incident beam is two megahertz and the blood flow velocity is five centimeters per second. Now, what is the Doppler shift frequency? Here, let's assume that the Doppler angle is set at 30 degrees and the speed of sound in the blood is 1540 meters per second. So if you substitute these parameter values in the Doppler shift frequency formula here, we would input the uh, Doppler, um, the incident beam here as 2 times 10 to the 6 hertz times the uh, 0.05 meters per second, which is the blood velocity, times cosine of 30, and times 2, all of that divided by 1540 meters per second. So if you calculate this, the Doppler frequency will be 112.5 hertz. So this is in the audible frequency range. So if you have experienced Doppler imaging before, you will notice that there is an audible sound that is coming from the Doppler system and it sort of tells you what the frequency shifts are depending on the amplitude of that sound. So if we plug in the, uh, the Doppler shift frequency, we add that to our um, uh, incident uh, frequency, then the reflected frequency would be about 2.0001125 megahertz. So you can see the orders of the Doppler shift frequency is much 
less compared to that of the incident or the reflected uh, frequency of the ultrasound beam. Now here's an example of a Doppler ultrasound display. So what I'm showing you here is a BMOD image of a vessel. This is the inferior vena cava. Now this is the large blood vessel that uh, brings blood from the lower half of your body to your heart. And you can see here that typically in a BMOD image, uh, blood vessels are, are hypoechoic compared to these surrounding tissues. So by anatomy, we would know that uh, this is the inferior vena cava. So you would set the um, line of the Doppler signal along focusing on that uh, inferior vena cava region. And if you would notice here that there is a uh, small gate with a cursor here that is of an angle similar to the direction of the vessel. So what this is, this is the angle cursor. And what sonographers typically use this for is to input the flow angle by adjusting this angle cursor right here. So they typically would align this cursor along parallel to the uh, blood vessel geometry right here. And so whatever is being inputted by the operator here will help compute the Doppler angle that is set, um, that is computed by the instrument. So there can be several mistakes in specifying this flow angle, and that can result in errors in the velocity estimates. So for instance, for small um, Doppler angles of 0 to 40 degrees, a 5 degree error in this flow angle can lead to less than 10% velocity error. But for larger Doppler angles, a 5% error or 5 degree error can lead to nearly 100% velocity error. So it's very important to be able to be trained in how to set these Doppler angles appropriately. Now these are two Doppler modes that are commonly used in ultrasound. We first will talk about the continuous wave Doppler or CW Doppler here. What happens is that there are two crystals, two piezoelectric elements in the transducer that are doing continuous transmission and reception of the um, echo signals from the blood. We also have pulse wave Doppler here where one crystal produces short bursts of ultrasound. So I will talk about the principles behind each of these systems as well as the advantages and disadvantages. But these two Doppler modes are frequently used in clinical ultrasound. For the first continuous wave Doppler system, this is the simplest, least expensive of the Doppler devices. What it includes is a continuous wave um, function generator here, an oscillator, that will then send a signal to the transducer. One of the transducer elements will transmit the signal to the tissue, and the echoes received from the blood will then be received by another piezoelectric element. So here's just an example of what a waveform of a transmitted wave looks like here. And depending on the um, direction of the blood flow, you can either get a received wave with a frequency that is higher or lower than the transmitted wave. And in this case, you can see that the received wave has a higher frequency, meaning that the reflectors or the red blood cells are moving towards the transducer. So after the received signal is received by this um, piezoelectric element, it then gets amplified by an amplifier circuitry right here. Subsequently, the signal goes into a demodulator circuit. And what happens here is that the reference signal and the echo signals received by the transducer are multiplied by each other. So here's just an example of the product of the reference and echo signals. Now, as you would have recalled in your mathematics course, multiplication of two signs creates a difference and a sum signal. Now the difference signal corresponds to the Doppler frequency signal, which we are interested in. After it goes to the demodulator, then a wall filter is applied to the signal to remove the low frequency Doppler signals from slow moving reflectors such as the vessel walls. So this is just how, uh, this is how, an example of how a Doppler signal would look like. Now it's important to also understand how you will choose 
the Doppler ultrasound frequency. And there's a trade-off between resolution and penetration depth. So we desire higher frequency ultrasound for high resolution, but adequate penetration of the ultrasound beam through the tissue is needed. And this decreases with increasing frequency. We know that the source of the Doppler signals are the red blood cells, and blood cells are Rayleigh scatterers. And we also re recall from a previous lecture that the backscattered intensity from these Rayleigh scatterers is proportional to the frequency to the fourth power. So we can use high frequency to increase the intensity of the echo signals scattered from the blood. But we know that as the frequency increases, ultrasound attenuation also increases. So the choice of your ultrasound frequency is related to the depth of the vessel and attenuation. Typically what is done is for small superficial vessels, uh, ultrasound frequencies of 8 to 10 megahertz are used. For higher depths and tissues with more attenuation, then the, the uh, frequencies used can be as low as 2 megahertz. Now let's continue to discussing the advantage and disadvantages of each technique. So then the advantage of the continuous wave Doppler is that it can accurately display the flow without aliasing. And we'll talk about aliasing in the next lecture. A disadvantage is that because you are using continuous wave signals, there is no time delay information. So it's challenging to figure out the exact range location of what you are imaging. Now the advantage of pulse wave Doppler is that because you are using shorter cycles of a pulsed wave, then you can have better range resolution. You can utilize the time delay information to be able to locate the scatterers. A disadvantage is that you're unable to measure high velocities due to aliasing, which we'll discuss in a subsequent lecture. Now let's talk about the pulse Doppler system. We first uh, select Doppler signals from specific depths using a range gate. So here I have a schematic of a pulse Doppler system where you have a transmitted signal sent to the transducer and that same piezoelectric element is receiving the echoes coming from the scatterers in the blood. Now that signal is being received into the amplifier circuitry so that we can enhance the amplitude of the signals. Now some instruments allow the operator to vary the pulse duration and this can vary the sensitivity. In fact, more cycles can improve the sensitivity of imaging. However, this comes at an ex expense of more ultrasound exposure to the patient with the expense of reduced axial resolution. So the number of cycles can be dialed appropriately depending on the application. So once that signal is amplified by the uh, amplifier circuitry here, it is then sent to the demodulator. And the output of the demodulator depends on either the amplitude of the echoes from the reflectors in the blood, as well as the phase of the echo signals. And the phase is really important to incorporate the distance of the scatterers. Now the range gate isolates the signal from the desired depth, which is selected by the operator right here. And then that signal is sent to a sample and hold unit which temporarily stores the received signal until the next transmit pulse is being sent. So this allows for pulse echo imaging in pulse Doppler. Afterwards, that signal is sent through a wall filter again to remove the low frequency Doppler signals that is being sent by slowly moving structures such as the blood vessel walls. Now, when we talk about which region we're imaging in the blood vessel. We talk about the sample volume. So the region from which the signals are selected is called the sample volume right here. So I have a schematic of a transducer and the ultrasound beam, typically a focused beam is being sent. And this cross-sectional area of the sample volume is determined by the ultrasound beam width along the scan plane, as well as the beam width perpendicular to the scalp scan plane. So a tightly focused ultrasound beam has a narrower beam area, therefore it has a narrower sample volume. Now the axial length of the sample volume is determined by the pulse duration. 
or how many cycles is in your wave. It also is determined by the gate size that the user is selecting. So if you have a narrow gate, then the, you will be imaging a narrower range of velocities. If you have a larger gate, then you will be looking into a larger range of velocities in the blood. Now let's talk about the types of flow that are present in blood vessels. So here is a schematic of three different flow profiles that could happen. You have your laminar parabolic flow here, wherein typically at the center of the vessel lumen, you have the highest blood velocity. As the scatterer is moving towards the blood vessel wall, the velocity of that scatterer will drop nearly zero. So in this laminar flow profile, you have a smooth flow of a range of velocities from slow velocities to moderately fast. There's no abrupt discontinuities in the flow. It's fairly smooth. And these continuities can either be caused by obstructions or turns in the vascular system. Now what I'm showing here is another example of a flow profile uh, categorized being as blunt flow. And this typically happens in larger vessels, such as the larger arteries in your arterial system. Now the actual velocity profile across any vessel depends on the diameter of the vessel, the mechanical properties of the blood, as well as the flow velocity. So in this example here, if you have an obstruction in the vessel, that can also change the internal diameter of the lumen, meaning that in this obstruction, the diameter of the lumen narrows. Now what happens is that as the blood flow is going from left to right, it hits this region, then the blood flow will undergo turbulence. It becomes disturbed. And this can be sensed by Doppler ultrasound. The number of different Doppler frequencies depends on the distribution of velocities in your vessel. If you have a nice laminar flow, there'll be a narrow distribution of velocities. If you have turbulent flow, you can imagine many different scatters that are moving in various directions and various speeds. Then you have a larger distribution of velocities in that vessel. It also depends on the transducer beam width. Now, if you have a smaller transducer beam width, it means that you are looking into a smaller region of the vessel. And typically within that smaller region, you will have more narrow velocity profile compared to a larger transducer beam width. The size of the sample volume also matters, especially for pulse Doppler. Now, when we talk about Doppler spectral analysis, what it is is a quantitative analysis showing distribution of Doppler frequencies. And let's look more into that further. So what happens in spectral analysis is that you have your complex ultrasound signal. And that is analyzed into simpler frequency components. And what is typically done with a complex signal is it passes through a fast Fourier transform analyzer that will bin it through these simpler frequency components. So what you see here is a typical uh, spectrum, a schematic of a spectrum, Doppler spectrum. So you have on the y-axis the velocities, and we're binning it as per the velocities that are present in the blood vessel. And the magnitudes, these each individual pixels represent binning according to the magnitudes of the uh, velocity. So if you look at this, uh, this color scale of how it would be binned is that here we have an example of five bins where each bin corresponds to a certain velocity that is present in the blood. So here we have 60, 65, 70, 75, and 80. So if you have a darker uh, pixel right here, it means that within that region, you're experiencing a lot more of the scatters that are moving at 70 centimeters per second. Away from that, you're seeing scatters that are moving in other um, blood velocities. So when you see this uh, velocity profile right here, or this uh, Doppler spectrum, what it's showing is showing you the distribution of the frequencies that are Doppler shift frequencies that are present in the blood. It means that there are many different scatterers that are going through various Doppler frequencies um, in, in the blood vessel. So when you're looking at this Doppler display right here, here is what a color Doppler image 
looks like, which I'll talk more about in the next lecture. But at the bottom, what's typically shown is the Doppler spectrum. You can see that in the y-axis, we're showing the velocity, um, and that can be calculated from the Doppler shift frequencies. And you see that the white signal here is not only a white a uh, single line or a curve, right? It's basically showing you a distribution of um, pixels that are within each of the time. Um, this is as a function of time right here. Now here is showing you what the Doppler spectra looks like for different flow conditions. So if you have a laminar flow right here, you send your range gate, you position your range gate at the center of the lumen. Um, if you adjust your range gate such that it's quite narrow, then you will get a Doppler spectrum that is pretty quite narrow in distribution right here. Now, if you have an obstruction, if you set a range gate at a particular region, the, due to the obstruction, there will be turbulent flow. And that will cause a spreading in the Doppler spectrum, as you can see here. Now, if you have a condition such as stenosis right here or narrowing of the artery, Typically what happens from a larger uh, part of the vessel to the narrower part, there's an increase in velocity of that uh, blood flow. And that increase in velocity also will cause the uh, turbulence at the outside, the out output of that stenotic region right here. So there'll be some mixing, some swirling going on here. And that in a Doppler spectrum will look like as various distribution of Doppler uh, frequencies. So as you can see, the Doppler spectrum will look something like this, where there's really large spectral broadening right here. And clinicians actually use this, the Doppler spectrum, to be able to identify these turbulent flow, identify the locations in the arteries that are obstructed with some sort of plaque, for instance, that are, is caused by atherosclerosis or a stenosis um, that is caused um, by plaques as, or blood clots as well. In addition to looking at the spectrum, one can also quantify and, and give parameters according to what is shown in the spectrum. So there have been some quantitative metrics that can provide data on the relative resistance of flow of the vascular network. And this is helpful for diagnosing several diseases, including hypertension or, or um, blood clots. So, one example of a quantitative parameter is the pulsatility index, or PI. And that is computed by the max or the peak systolic um, of the velocity profile right here, minus the minimum right here, divided by the average flow during the cycle right here. And this is just an example of showing you uh, what it would look like. Another type of quantitative parameter is called the resistivity index. And this is a little simpler than the pulsatility index. What it is, is just looks at the max uh, velocity right here at peak systolic and the minimum diastolic velocity right here during the um, cardiac cycle. So these two metrics have been widely used and in uh, Doppler imaging system, you will see these metric values being displayed um, in the monitor. So I hope this gives you a good summary of the uh, Doppler ultrasound. And we talked about Doppler effect. We've talked about parameters that affect the Doppler frequency estimates. Um, we looked into continuous wave and pulse wave Doppler, as well as how spectral analysis is performed and what sorts of quantitative parameters can be derived from the spectral uh, parameters. With that, um, we'll discuss in the next lecture more about uh, Doppler ultrasound. Thank you.